So I'm going to go through the presentation, even though I do not have a way to share it. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about the software supply chain. Uh, the agenda is uh, going to be software supply chain, the attack surface of the uh, sop software supply chain, uh, uh, commercial open, uh, uh, commercial off the shelf uh, software, as well as commercial off the shelf, uh, uh, you know, uh, software shared uh, open source software, okay? Uh, then the trends in open uh, in uh, software supply chain compromises, evaluation of data on actual attacks, and the solar winds hack, which is obviously the uh, hack that brought everybody uh, the attention to the software supply chain and the special case of open source software and uh, some mitigation measures especially for uh, especially for hyperledger okay that's that's the so f first thing is software is ubiquitous uh, which obviously means that it is highly pervasive it's everywhere and it is on 24/7 and obviously software is evolving fast and it's highly complex. These are all very simple statements, but they have uh, tremendous implications. Um, so the, what are the consequences? The consequences are because of the high pace of evolution of software, most enterprises do not develop uh, in-house uh, software. They get commercial off-the-shelf software or commercial open source software. They also, it is also based on the principle of reuse and uh, outsourcing complexity. Um, the world's appetite for software is ever increasing. Uh, somebody said that uh, software is eating the world, but I think it is more that the world is eating software uh, and having it as a greater part of its diet. And because of this, the world has many cases of indigestion and poisoning and major, major organs can be affected. These are all metaphors, but in the end, the metaphors make sense when uh, the, uh, the abstraction of the metaphor and the actual use, actual observed uh, problems in the world coincide. Now, in terms of the software supply chain attacks, there was a well-known thought experiment from Ken Thompson in 1984. Um, he was speaking as a Turing Award uh, honoree, and it was a Turing Award lecture. And he talked about how a C compiler can be hacked to insert a Trojan horse, leaving no traces in the source. Essentially, the source is modified to allow certain passwords, uh, you know, which are not in the list of uh, approved passwords to, uh, the source is hacked, make the changes made, the C compiler itself is written in C, so it is compiled and then the source is put back to its original uh, you know, without the hack. And so the no traces of this hack are found in the source, no static analysis, no dynamic analysis. Uh, I mean, no analysis of the source would let you know 
that the uh, compiler has been altered. As the level of the program gets lower, this is what uh, Ken Thompson said. Ken Thompson, of course, is the duo of Ken uh, Thompson and Richie who created the Unix uh, operating system and also the C compiler. And uh, as the level of the program gets lower, these bugs will be harder and harder to detect. A well-installed microcode bug will be almost impossible to detect. So it's already known that in 1984 that you can do this. You can actually uh, hack the supply chain, the actual uh, you know, software that builds the other software and insert a bug into uh, the compiled program. Um, he also made another point, which is that you have to trust the uh, writers of the program rather than trusting uh, anybody else. So, so, and he made another point, which was the crime of breaking into a computer should be as bad as a crime of breaking into somebody else's house or stealing a car or something like that. But obviously people can do this frictionlessly from afar and they do not face the same consequences. Um, now we go to the SolarWinds uh, Orion IT management pro product, which was backdoor to insert malware using a component uh, with an innocuous name. Uh, its name is uh, name was taskhostw.exe. This hack was codenamed Sunspot by the analysts. Uh, so anyway, people are uh, offering me suggestions on how to uh, make, uh, you know, share the screen, but I'm not, since I'm on the uh, other tab where I'm looking at the presentation, I have no way of really doing this right now, but Anyway, the I go back to the SolarWinds Orion IT management uh, product, which was ubiquitous again because it was uh, it was used by many many enterprises. The malware was codenamed uh, Sunspot by the analysts, it is not the name uh, which was in the software itself, but because of the uh, word solar winds, obviously it was called Sunspot. Uh, the sun, Sunspot does exactly what um, Ken Thompson said it, you know, was uh, talking about. Basically it monitors the running processes uh, to see whether msbuild.exe is uh, running, and then it replaces one of the uh, source files to include uh, the backdoor cord, uh, inserting, of course, things like uh, uh, pragma warnings off and uh, uh, turning the pragma warnings on and off, which I've done myself in many cases to avoid uh, spurious warnings. Uh, and several safeguards were uh, added to Sunspot to avoid the Orion builds from failing. Orion was chosen because it is used extensively in enterprises, both government and private. Actually, uh, and of course, after this uh, hack and after the, uh, so the primary hack must have involved compromise of some sort and allowing the attackers into the uh, into the SolarWinds 
uh, build server, uh, which is where all this stuff was being done. And since it was extensively distributed to more than 18,000, well, the estimate is more between 18,000 and 30,000 enterprises uh, used uh, the hacked version of the software. And I have these beautiful diagrams here, which talks about uh, Sunburst uh, as a continuation of attacks that had already happened and were clearly documented. Uh, and in this, the software supply uh, chain stack, which was, uh, you know, goes from system design, implementation, iterative testing and deployment, the compromise could happen at various points. And there were well-known pathways, uh, account access uh, compromise, stolen certificates, flawed cryptography, code injection, forged certificates, uh, unsigned and broken signature systems. So all of these were could could have been involved, but Sunburst was very interesting because it not only compromised, uh, I mean, as is usual with uh, supply chain attacks, it not only compromises the build server of a commercial off the shelf software distributor, but obviously it goes into every place that software is used where they could install other, uh, they could drop other malware and hence break into all of the customers of the attack. Obviously, um, the open source software is, is a very, uh, very high on the list of uh, software to be compromised because it has such uh, wide reach. We'll go into that in detail uh, later, but right now I I'm talking about the fact that the, the attack is not on the solar winds, but on other systems, mostly the customer systems. And using that, they, 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 the attack spread laterally to Microsoft, well, in, uh, identity and access management systems, using which they were able to do compromise a lot of the cloud uh, system. And they were going after specific intelligence like emails, and other uh, very sensitive topics. So this is a nation state, obviously, uh, attacking the infrastructure of the United States in this case, but it also uh, spread to other countries. Uh, so the main thing to note here is that Many of the pathways used are were very commonly known, never fixed or never um, never adequately addressed, and and uh, the software took uh, the software took. A long time to properly launch, and so the uh, obviously the uh, attackers were very discreet in uh, in covering their tracks, and they uh, the attack. Well, the word attack implies, or even sunburst implies, a action that takes place in a very short period of time. But this uh, this should really be something that 
uh, you know, sh should be used to describe something that happened over eight months or about 10 months. And uh, that persistence and patience and covering the tracks is what helped uh, the attackers gain control over so many, uh, so many systems. Uh, if you go back to the, um, if you go back to the actual number of organizations compromised, 18,000 or so, uh, they only concentrated on a few. Obviously, they didn't want to attack 18,000 organizations. Uh, 425 members of the U.S. Fortune 500, uh, systematic, systemically important vendors like Microsoft and Intel, and nearly a dozen U.S. federal government agencies, including the departments of Treasury, Homeland Security, state and energy, as well as state and local governments. So this is pretty much the entire software infrastructure of uh, governments and private companies. When private companies say, oh, we are, you know, the governments get attacked because they are bureaucratic, and so on. That is not true. They, you know, out of Fortune 500, 425 members have been attacked. Uh, and the linchpin services like identity and access management software from Azure, uh, Azure Active Directory, were compromised to gain access to many user email accounts. It was a cloud based compromise as well as a sign of a state actor with time money, patience, and discipline. More than a IT failure, this is a strategic failure for the United States. That is what uh, uh, some of the references that I have uh, quoted say. Now, coming to open source, open source software is like uh, the SolarWinds Orion because it is used everywhere. And if you if you want some numbers, I can say that about 1.5 trillion open source software uh, downloads were requests were expected in 2020. And uh, many enterprise software components have a significant uh, portion of their software is open source. And, you know, there is 430% year over year growth in cyber attacks uh, targeting open source software projects. Nearly 40% of all NPM packages rely on code with known vulnerabilities. You know, this is this is no way to uh, uh, proceed because this open source, as you know, is a community resource, just like a well. And that's why this uh, presentation is called the poison well. The a well is where every, where everybody goes to drink and obviously if the well is poisoned everybody gets affected um, so software open source software is becoming more and more ubiquitous not only regular software but you know open source so it is it is an attack ve vector and we should be aware of it in hyperledger because we create we are, we are the largest consortium of DLT technology open source software. Um, but it's also well known that, I mean, not well known, but uh, you know, the statistics tell us uh, that there is a separation between the people who act and the people who do not act. That means Exemplary projects are 530 times faster in updating dependencies and finding out 
the latest uh, vulnerabilities that have been uh, released in their dependencies. First of all, the number of uh, the first thing to do is to create a uh, software bill of materials, SBOM, which is similar to the regular bill of materials for any any uh, product, so that if there's a problem in any of the supply, any of the uh, any of the components of the software of the bill, bill of materials, then you can trace it back to the source, and you can say, okay, you got to you got to have a, either a new component or or a way to address it. So we can. We can start with a software bill of materials, which is nothing but a list of all the dependencies, obviously not built by humans, but by using SCA, software component analysis, uh, like white, bolt, white source bolt. Uh, and you can actually install it in, the, in your GitHub repository. Uh, I have forked several uh, of Hyperledger projects. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of what I found, uh, but you can actually ins install white source bolt and do a scan of the, uh, of the components. And if the components in any of the dependency chains are found to be compromised, then uh, the white source bolt would create an automatic uh, issue for you so that you have to fix it. Uh, and SBOM uh, best practices, tools, and expertise are being developed by NIST. And Hyperledger repositories should uh, have a develop a software bill of materials uh, as part of our security practice and automate this and using tools that are freely available. This is the this is the first thing that we can do. Uh, and I have unfortunately uh, run out of time almost. So I'm going to go back to you guys and see whether you have any questions uh, or anything that that I can ha hope to answer in the next uh, few minutes. And I know that 22 people are watching. I'm sorry that I was not able to share the screens. Uh, I, it started, uh, anyway, I, I don't want to complain about this, but it's also very early here, uh, 4, 4, 4.30. So please uh, chat and let me know how you like the session, whether it's, uh, you know, I, I will end the session. I will leave because I don't know whether there's any other way to end the session. I hope you guys got something out of it. Uh, please put your uh, stuff on chat. If you, if you did, that would be a great thing. Thank you.